Ladies and gentlemen, our referee has called a stop to this contest, declaring the winner by knockout and new MMA Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another exciting round of and new MMA show. I am your host, Michael Hansen. I know a thing or two about talking into microphones because <laughs> I am a ring announcer and an MMA cage announcer, and I am joined this week, as I always am, by my two friends who bring MMA punditry to new heights. Introducing first, on the left side of your screens, in the dope Knicks hat, Mark Prio. Mark, what's up, bud? What up? A couple of us wearing hoodies on here tonight. You can tell it's getting cold. I am currently a zombie because my one and a half year old has decided that he hates sleep. So I'm dying inside, but I am going to power through this thing and try to bring the energy for the next however long this goes. Let's do it. And joining <laughs> us on the right side of your screens, all the way from Florida, Omar Artola. Omar, what's going on? So it's starting to get cold over here too. Oh, it or not. shut up. Oh, but hear me out. Went to the gym, got super sweaty, drenched in sweat, walked outside, almost caught a cold. Oh, stop. Oh, God. Oh, my Jeez. God. Freezing. Dude, you're from New York, so stop. Yeah. No the problem is, is I'm not used to wearing as many layers anymore, and so now I have to remember to bring a hoodie with me. Hey, you know what this is? Get to the show. Let's get to so the show. rough out this here, is, guys. This is on the world's smallest it's, violin. It's so rough out here. Okay. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> well, guys, we have a tremendous UFC pay-per-view to recap. So many great fights. This was a such a great card on paper, uh, and it really delivered. You know, sometimes there's great cards that kind of flop. Sometimes there's cards that are not great on paper, which turn out a lot of great, great fights. This was like the unicorn, where it was an amazing card on paper and had so many great performances. So real quick, let me just run down this episode on a new MMA show. We're going to start, as we always do, with our first segment on the marquee. Then we're going to recast some other fights from UFC 268, as well as some Bellator fights from last weekend. Then we're going to jump into our lightning round. Then we're going to check out who has risen and who has fallen in our very own ranking systems, the Prio rankings. And then we're going to dive into the MMA sphere. And then we're going to look ahead to this coming weekend's UFC fight night. So boys, before we get into our very first segment on the marquee, let's remind our audience and our listeners, first of all, thank you so much for listening and thank you for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Hit that bell icon so that you get reminded. Find us wherever you get your podcasts if you want the audio only version. And of course, find us on social media, join the conversation at and new MMA show in all the places. I think that just about covers it. Let us get into our first segment on the marquee. This week, the name on the marquee has got to be Kamaro, the Nigerian nightmare, Usman, who defeated once again Colby Covington by unanimous decision, earning a 48-47, 48-47, and 49-46 mark. Let me send it over to you first. Usman defends his welterweight strap yet again. What is your initial reaction? What a damn fight. Again, uh, not maybe not quite as great as the first one, but pretty damn good in, in its own right. What a rivalry this is. Both of these guys have zero quit in them. You got to give Colby his credit. I thought this man was done after round two. He honestly looked like shit to me in, in the early rounds. I, I, I thought he looked so tentative. I, I was shocked by it. Thought it was over after round two. Maybe not that it was like that he was – definitely going to get finished as soon as round three started, but that it was just a lost cause. And he comes back, he nearly takes round three, and then he wins four and five. I mean, you got to give the guy, the guy's credit. He is tough as shit. Yeah. And fights like that always make me wonder what would happen if guys just fought like endless rounds in, until one <laughs> broke, because it felt like neither of those guys was ever going anywhere. Um, but anyway, I did score it for Usman. Uh, I scored it 48, 46. Hmm. I had a 10, nine, 10, eight, 10, nine in the third, but it was close. And then nine, 10, nine, 10 in favor of Colby to, to close it out. But speaking of wow. round two, we really need to clarify in MMA what a 10, eight round is, hmm. because to me, that's a 10, eight round. He had two knockdowns 
and then Colby dives for the legs to try to, to stay safe. And Kamaru is just pounding body shots. Like, I don't even know, seven or eight of them to, to close out that round with, with Colby not, not defending at all. To me, that's a 10-8. Yeah. You got saved by the and, bell. Yeah, and, and maybe I'm the one who's wrong here. Maybe, you know, maybe that shouldn't be scored a 10-8. But we can't have every round that is possibly a 10-8 be debated every damn fight unless mm-hmm. someone's like nearly killing a guy. Like, can we please, please get some clarity on what a 10-8 round is so we don't have to have this conversation all, all the time? Like, let's make it super clear to judges so we don't have to keep doing this. Because honestly, all I could think about with that is that when I heard the judges' scorecards and zero of them gave Kamaru a 10-8, was that a lot of people thought Colby won round three. Like, if you look online, if you look at MMA decisions, a lot of people scored round three for Colby. I okay, did. you did too. Yeah. So did you? how did you score the fight, Mike, before I keep going? Did you give Colby four and five as well? I gave him three and four and, and now five, five. I have to watch it again to be quite honest. I kind of, I, in my initial reaction, I think I did. And did I you think I want to give it to five? Did you score it a 10-8 for Kamaru in the second? No. No. So okay. So you're you're making my point for me. Yeah. That that if that's the case, if you're not giving Kamaru that 10-8 in in the second, and say you are giving Colby three, four, five. Say even if you don't think Colby won three, say Colby lands one more big punch in three, and now you do think he won three. Like, yeah. if you're not giving Kamaru 10-8 in that second round, yeah. that fight ends with with Colby as the champion if you give yeah. him three, four, five. Yeah. Whereas whereas if you're giving what, in my opinion, is the rightful 10-8 in round two, it at least ends in a draw, and the belt is still staying with, with Kamaru. So... I would love for clarity on what a 10-8 is supposed to be. And like I said, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not a 10-8, but if it's not, I would like to know because I, I want these scores to be right. And in my opinion, Kamara won that fight. And if judges had seen that third for Colby, two of those judges would have scored at 48-47 Colby because they didn't give Kamara the 10-8 and the belt yeah. would have changed hands, which would have been fucking crazy to me. So anyway, to move on and to go to the man on the marquee here who, who deserves the credit as I'm talking about everything else ex- except him. Kamaru Usman, the guy is incredible. He has made himself into such an intimidating force in there. The whole time you watch him, you almost feel like he can't be hurt. Like, yeah, he gets caught, but nothing really happens. He kind of just eats them. He always feels like he's he's possibly a moment away from some explosive, huge something. He's just such an intimidating guy to, to watch on your screen. Like, you feel like the other guy's in trouble at, at all times. Yeah, He's won 15 straight fights in the UFC. His next defense, if it's successful, will tie him for the record with Anderson Silva. When it's all said and done for this guy, there's going to be a lot of debates around who is the welterweight goat. He He's reached that point where that, that conversation is going to be had between him and George St. Pierre. Mm-hmm. Um, but y- you can't have a better run than than the run that he is on right now, and, and all props to him. All, awesome performance. Hold on real quick. Go back. What is he tying Anderson Silva with if he wins again? Most consecutive wins in the UFC. He has 15. Anderson, wow. The record is 16 he's, for Anderson Silva. He's already there. Yeah. Yeah. Omar, let, let's bring you in here. What was your reaction to Usman defending his title over Covington? It was a great fight. It felt like a different fight, though. Um, mm. <clears throat> there was a lot more. I mean, there was groundwork to begin with. I mean, at least there were attempts. And, um, you know, Colby tried to get him up against the cage and control him. And I think just like we talked about last week, that wasn't really going to work with Kamaru. Um, and he didn't. And I think Colby just ended up paying a lot of uh, – uh, ended up eating a lot of damage for a lot of those attempts, at least early on. Um, but it was an amazing – it was an amazing fight. I, I didn't score at 10-8 in the, in the second round either. Um, I could definitely see the argument for it, but I think I'm still stuck in the mindset that, like, a 10-8 round means you basically have to kill a guy. That's kind of where I'm stuck. Which, if uh, we're still doing that, that's fine. And then I don't score at a 10-8. But I'm under the impression they've changed these rules where you're supposed to be handing out 10-8s. Then. But they they haven't changed it unified yet. It's not it's not everywhere. Like some states have this shit. It's like the hand down kind of thing. Like hmm, I thought we were past that. I thought it was everywhere now. Now I need to look at if New York uh, has it or not. Yeah, because that would so, explain some things. If if New York has it, it sh- I mean if New York has it, that round should have been a ten eight round if we're going by the new rules or the new curriculum or whatever. Um, I don't mean then, to cut you off. I just want to say one one little thing to me. If, if I'm in charge of how fights get scored, that type of round needs to be a 10-8 in a fight like that because it was so clearly the biggest, most dominant round compared to the other four. So I feel mm. like it needs extra credit. 
Well, if we're going to do it that way, for me, it's more about the damage. Like you knocked him down twice. That ten, that shouldn't be a ten nine compared to an a regular ten nine where That's guys I mean. are basically just sparring each other. Like yeah. that doesn't make any sense to me. That's what I mean. Yeah. So if, sorry, if there's ahead. significant damage or something like that, it should definitely count again. Like you know, just like in boxing, if you knock somebody down, you lose a point. There's a reason for it. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm would kind of like to see some of those changes instead of still being relatively subjective. Um. Anyway, it was a great fight. Um, you guys know I don't care for Colby, but you do have to give him credit. He's a tough oh ass dude. Yeah, yeah, significant. I mean, he's he's crazy tough, crazy tough. Um, the fact that he even came back to win rounds after those knockdowns is kind of crazy to me. Uh, I also thought he was finished. I was kind of surprised Usman didn't put the pressure on him, um, yeah. and and kind of go for the kill. He talked about it afterwards, how he didn't really, you know, that, how he recognized that Colby's tough and it's not easy to put him away. And he didn't want to burn himself out trying to finish this kid and not succeed, basically. So okay. he stuck to the game plan, kept very composed. And, you know, like you said, he dropped four and five, but I think he had done enough work definitely in the first three rounds, whether you give him the second round as a 10-8 or not. I mm-hmm. think he did enough to win the, win the fight. I agree. If, Colby, if Colby took three, four, and five, but the second round was a 10-8. Would that end up in a draw? I'm it would have really been dumb. a draw. I'm Correct. dumb with math. I'm a yeah. dumb person. Yeah. Man, say what you want to say about Colby Covington. You know, antics aside, uh, shtick aside, and I've heard many people, many different people say that it that it is sort of an act and a shtick. I, I mean, of I'm sure. it's an act. It's just, I mean, here's, yeah, I here's, so. here's the issue I really have. I know it's an act. He's not real. I get it. That's never been my problem. My problem is, you could have chosen to do any fucking act you wanted, any any persona you wanted, anything you wanted to do, but you chose that one during yeah. a time in this country where everything was super fucked up. We're not really even not fucked up now, but he decided to insert himself and use the political scheme and the Donald Trump and this and the that and you know make America great again and get all crazy during a time where that was very divisive. Like you could have done anything. But you chose yeah. to do that. And I think that's my problem. It's like you chose to be a dickhead in well, the middle of a time where we didn't really need that shit. He made two shifts. He First, he was just sort of like a regular nice guy in the UFC who was like won some fights, but he wasn't like really on the radar yet. Then he made a conscious choice. He's like, I'm going to be Colby Covington, a, the dick. And he was just like a dick to people. He was a, a troll. He became a loud mouth. It seems like a very conscious choice. Uh, Fabricio Verdum threw a boomerang at him. Uh, that Classic. happened. And then he made like another shift away from just like being just sort of general troll to ma- becoming very political. And, and again, it seems like a very conscious choice where he says, you know, I see this opportunity and this like a land grab. I'm going to be the conservative. I, was, I mean, look, there are other conservative like, you know, fairly outspoken conservative guys in, in combat sports. Uh, I think Chell Sonnen is a fairly conservative guy. I know Chandler, uh, Chandler is, absolutely. Gaethje M- is. Most people, I feel like, in the UFC tend to be on the conservative uh, side, oh, for yeah, the most ben, part. Yeah. Ben Askren tweets a lot uh, I, from a conservative I, point of view. I always say this about Colby on the exact point you just made, that if Colby skipped the dickhead part, and just went straight to like rocking the make America. Like Jorge wore the freaking make America great again. Yeah, hat Jorge. Or Rome, whatever oh the hell God, he you're right. And and people dealt with it. Like if if Colby just skipped to the political thing and said some stuff about Trump and wore the hat and did whatever. Like yeah, there'd still be people that hated him who are on the opposite side politically. But it wouldn't be the same level of like vitriol toward Colby. It is that because he first opted to become this huge d bag, and then yeah. combined that with that. So it everyone hates the guy. You know what I mean? If, if he right. skipped that, that aspect of it, it wouldn't be the same yeah. situation. Yeah. Yeah. You're totally right. Like plenty of guys express their political beliefs. Some people are on the progressive side. Some people are on the conservative side, but it's that Colby Covington. He starts all of his promos with what's up nerds and virgins. And he's yeah, just like, like that kind of shit. He's yes. like pretending to be like a high school bully. Yes. Uh, but, but, but just like a high school bully, the nerd, the, the dude that's calling everybody nerds and virgins is buying yes. women who won't sleep with him either. Correct. The one hiring like, women to be around him. It's just, oh, he, geez. He's, like, it's, it's honestly, I, I, like, I can't stand the guy. He, like, I honestly feel like if I met him in real life, even removing this shell of bullshit, 
there would still be a scent left over. Like there, there's, <laughs> like I said, there was a choice that he made there. So there's something dickhead about him for real. And I just, I don't, I can't, I can't with it. But Hey, I'll tell you what, there is a version of Colby Coven, Covington that I love. And that is the Colby Covington that fights in a Facts. cage. Facts. Yeah. I mean, I, I realized this. Uh, I didn't realize this until this past fight where I was like, man, I love watching this guy fight. He's, he's yeah. great to watch. Yeah. He's, he's, he's getting outclassed and yet he's out. And, and, you know, once he got knocked down in the second round, he came back in that third round and he woke up and he started putting it on Usman and he was out working Usman from the third round pretty much to the final bell. And man, give that guy his respect. Whew, what a the fight. only thing, the only thing I would ever criticize about his game is his power. He yeah. still has pillow hands. He yeah. he's had he pillow hands. He yeah. will continue to have pillow hands until he changes something. And, and again, against somebody, yo, my cat is just tearing my wall up right now. <laughs> yeah. It, it never matters against most people because he can just out wrestle them and outpace them and out control right. them. And it doesn't matter. But when you can't do that, then it's kind of a big flaw. Right. And that's what we talked about last week is like, if you take any part of Colby's secret sauce out, any mm -hmm. one part, it's not you it's not the secret sauce yeah, of course it doesn't work of course and i mean but, I mean, but kamaru but kamaru fights the same way but it's not yes. the same thing right his secret oh, yeah. sauce is almost like the way they give it to your pf changs where they give you little individual parts and then you got to put it all together on your own how you like it like sometimes he could be spicier than others sometimes he could be more oily than than the last time like yes however however kamaru decides he wants to adjust himself he can and still be dominant in those moments Colby yep. is not generally that type of person. Either mm -hmm. his style is working or he's kind of getting his ass beat. And I'm, I would need to go back and watch mm. the, the, the fight again. Cause I kind of want to see where Kamaru dropped off in four and five and why, because it seemed like he had a lot of control over those three rounds. It seemed odd to go to, to drop yeah. four and five. I mean, or, Usman is or he, get, he just got clipped a couple times, like clipped. Yeah. Clipped. There, there was one where his legs went. Yeah. yeah. I think um, it was at the very end and, and like within the last five seconds of round four. I think uh, that's right. He clipped Usman and he yes. wobbled and then the bell rang. Right. Yeah. And if, yeah. if Colby put a little bit more power into those, that's more than just a stumble. That's yeah. a possibly a knockdown, possibly yeah. a yeah. KO. Like it's just sometimes I think with him, especially like with the volume he throws, if he worked like Nick Diaz or Nate Diaz, he would be able to control when he's peppering and when he's throwing a solid shot, because that's one thing that they do. Like if you're going to teach them, yeah, any, if you're going to teach kids that. anything about boxing from Nate and Nick Diaz, it's that it's yeah. the volume into the pepper. The for way sure. that they, they mix yeah. that up is, is gorgeous. The, the problem for the UFC is, and, and you can tell by how much we're talking about Colby. The problem is that he is so obviously good. He's good. And yeah. they need someone not named Kamaru to beat him. Right. Or else they're gonna have to find a way to market Usman Colby number three, even though it's right. two nothing. Like yeah, so yeah, they they, well, they kind of gotta hope someone else can can knock him down. Again, to Colby's credit, he called out the one person that makes sense, even yeah. though he has a fight lined up. I think regardless of how that goes, though, I don't think so. Jorge Masvidal, right? Jorge Masvidal is fighting Leon Edwards next month. Next yep. month. Next month. Yep. Um. Regardless of who wins that fight, if, if if Masvidal wins that fight, I don't think he gets a title shot. Oh no again. way, zero chance, right? Zero, zero chance. chance, right? Yeah. So if that happens, if he wins that fight, he gets Colby. Yeah, I, I think the fight against Colby makes sense. If he loses the fight against Leon, I still think the fight against Colby makes a whole hell of a lot of sense. It still Maybe. makes sense. I just wonder if they make it because if Jorge loses to Leon, that will be three straight losses, and I don't know if they'd want to risk Jorge losing four straight times. Mm. Totally, mm. totally. But it's I do think fight, that it's still a fight that's got to happen, though. Yeah. If honestly, if if Jorge loses, there's another route. You know, if Jorge wins, I agree. You totally make that fight. If he loses and you don't want to risk Jorge losing four in a row, you just got to make Colby fight one of Burns or Luque. I mean, they're both fucking awesome fights and they're right there. They they work perfectly. Just make totally. them accept one of those. Max yeah. said something gorgeous in one of his interviews where he was talking about the elevator riders versus the stair walkers and how people like to wait for their opportunities. And Colby has very much been one of those guys to wait at the elevator door to take him up to the championship spot. Mm. And, and, and what I'm saying is not necessarily taking 
the type of fights uh, right, I know that, that are necessary, right? To, to get back up there technically. Um, and Max is like, while y'all waiting for the other, I'm going to take the stairs. I'm going to whoop people's ass on the way up yeah. to the top. And I, I really love that mentality. And I think, and I'm curious to see if hmm. Colby even decides to take the stairs if he doesn't just wait for the elevator drive. So he did, I mean, granted, you can't trust anything Colby says, but he did say in the post fight multiple times that he'll fight anyone he has to fight to get back to the title shot. So we'll see if that holds true. I mean, yeah. that's probably true, but there's a lot of nuance in that statement where what is I need to get to the top mean? Like as far as right. the, yeah, the person, sure. right? They could tell him, I need you to fight this guy on this mm-hmm. date well how is that guy going to get me to the top and then that becomes a whole other yeah, yeah argument. Yeah. you know i love that the name of the marquee is kamaru usman and we spent i know i feel kind of bad about 10 it. minutes talking about his opponent but it was a great you, fight it was I a didn't great expect fight. that that's how that convo was going to go but it's that's all good. where it took us let's let's turn attention away from covington for for a moment and let's yes. talk about the name of the marquee kamaru usman yes who you know we're not really going to talk about like what's next for Usman because he's the champ. He's now been the champ for quite a few title defenses. Let's talk about this instead, because he is really starting to, with every title defense, he is inching himself closer and closer into this goat debate. So maybe yeah. not, you know, I, I don't think he's, he's quite at the point where we're going to talk about him in terms of all division, all time goat status, but certainly in terms of welterweight goat status, what do you, what are you guys thinking yeah. in terms of that as of right now, Mark, let's start with you. I mean, the guy has one loss in his whole career. It is pre-UFC. It's in his second fight of his entire career. He's 15-0 and 0 in the UFC. I can't even really think of him being hurt. Um, Hughes has lost fights. I think we're probably past Hughes at this point. I would think so. GSP has lost in the UFC. He's been knocked out in the UFC. There's an argument to be made. I mean, GSP's resume is crazy. He ended up winning a belt in another division. Um, you know, he's got he's got legends uh, on there that that he's beaten. It's 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 tough to say that Usman's better than GSP, and I honestly haven't like sat down and and thought about it myself. Who I who I would take? I think onto my head right now, it, it still at least feels like to me that GSP is the best welterweight of all time. But I think the conversation is going to need to be had fairly soon. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I'm not really in a rush to have that conversation. Kamaru's not done. Kamaru still has work yeah. to do. Kamaru's still going to have names to add to the list. GSP's done. GSP had his run, for better yeah. or worse. Um, he had, after that Matt Sarah loss, he racked up win on win on win on win one of which was obviously the 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 get back on Matt Sarah um so I I'm I think it's an unfair comparison right now taking one guy's entire career which is a lifetime for a career and another guy who's basically at the peak of his career at the peak of his physical endurance Mm-hmm. To, to say that they're like, he's on his way. I don't think he is a goat yet because he's not done. That's not like if his, if he ended today right now and said, I'm done, I retire. There's no way I think you put him above GSP. I don't. Oh, wow. Okay. I don't. I mean, I, I definitely don't, especially based on GSP's resume, having watched GSP's fights. Like mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot to be said about how GSP got everything done when a lot was really against him. Um, and to be clear, GSP was 20 and two in the UFC. Like his record was wild as well. Yeah. So I, I just, I think that Kamaru is, is still needs that time to build on that career for us to have that proper conversation. Cause it doesn't look like he's not going to be champion for quite some time. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I, I would say also that it's him being undefeated in the, in the UFC that really makes you ha- like, you can't not consider if he's, if he's there with, with GSP. Whereas if he takes a loss, the conversation kind of changes and he could still easily take a loss because obviously, as Omar said, his career is not done. But if he was to retire, never having lost in the UFC, it's going to be quite a conversation. All right. All right. And and real quick, speaking speaking of next and speaking of the Leon Edwards Jorge fight that we just said was coming up in a month, I really do hope that if Leon Edwards beats Jorge, that he gets his title shot. 
Like, oh my God, th- this whole time, I've never like really been a Leon Edwards guy. Like I've kind of understood the circumstances of why it hasn't happened for him, even though it has felt like a long time that he's been right there for this title shot. But like, we are here now. I, w- I was reading something today that was like, oh, well, Leon's already booked. So I, I think we should make Usman Luque. I'm like, the fight is in like three weeks. Let's just wait and see if Leon w- wins. Like we don't need to keep skipping the guy. Like if he wins, that is the fight. It's, t- it's time for Usman versus Leon Edwards. You think there could be just like a, he just doesn't get along with management. He seems like such a quiet and introverted guy. And Dana sounded he... like he, he was accepting that that's where they are. Like someone asked and he was like, if he wins, he's been waiting for ages. We kind of have to. I also think he doesn't play the game. Like, you know, a lot of guys, yeah. especially in that division, look at how, look at, look at Colby. It's just, it's just a perfect example. Colby was kind of in the same place where he was winning, but no one gave a shit all of a sudden he started calling everybody a dickhead and now everybody cares for better or worse. And it's, it's kind of like, Leon's not going to do that. He's never really done that. He's never really talked up, never really done a lot of promotion does what he's told for the most part, but nothing extra. So it's just, just no one knows, no one knows who he is. No one has any idea that this man is on the winning streak that he's on. No one has any idea how good he actually is because no one's ever really seen him fight because no one knows he's fighting. It's yeah. just, he's, it's sure. like, there is a responsibility. I think he has to put himself out there a little bit more. He doesn't have to whore himself out, but he does have to put himself out there a little bit more. Okay. I do want to say one more thing, if I may, before we move on from Usman, as we are now becoming more and more aware of just how incredible historically Kamaru Usman is, it makes me more and more sad. And I used to say this back then that I wished we could have seen this, that Habib didn't have that same like drive that some of these, like that Connor had to be like, I'm going to go up in a, a division. I'm going to win two belts and that the DC had, et cetera. Uh, can you imagine if Habib was like, all right, I'm going to go up to welterweight and try to win two belts. And we got to see Habib versus Usman. Oof. Like I, that fight would be one of the most incredible fights I've ever seen. And yeah. realistically, could be. And I don't even know who to grapple with him. He would be able to grapple with him. That's I think all that's I want to see. I don't even part. want them to throw punches. Just only grapple. <laughs> Same. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Have them both wear singlets. Yeah, it's a and, shame that uh, we can't see that. Yeah, that would be a real challenge for Khabib. <laughs> Call Triller. Put them in a trapezoid shaped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh God! But gentlemen, we have so much more to get to. So yeah. let us let us march on here. Guys, in the co main event, we had another great fight uh, in the women's strawweight division. And Thug Rose Nama Yunus defended her women's strawweight title against uh, uh, Wei Li Zhang once again, defeating her once again, this time by split decision. The scores read as follows 49 46 Rose, 48 47 Rose, and 48 47 Wei Li. Omar, let me start with you. Uh, upon watching this great co main event, what was your initial reaction? Holy shit. <laughs> Crazy fight. Um, it was It was obviously, th- this was kind of the way I thought it was going to go, to be honest. I think when we talked about it last week, I didn't really think that this was going to be the same one hit KO kind of thing. I think, and I, and I think it was obvious that Zhang took her way, way more seriously in the, this time around. Um, and it was a grueling fight. It was a war and it was back and forth. And I got to be honest, I got to watch it again because after a certain point, I stopped scoring. Yeah, it just, it just got, it just got crazy, man. Um, I was happy for Rose. I felt that that was the right call at the end of the fight. I didn't think that Whaley had done enough, um, but I, I honestly would need to go back, watch it again to, you know, be a hundred percent accurate with that take. Guys, this was the first time in my MMA watching life that I have watched a fight and had zero sense, zero implicit intuitive sense of who was winning this fight from the, from the first round to the end of the fight. I'm watching this fight. And I was like, hmm, no idea who's winning. This is very competitive. It's just, it was just so back and forth with that being said, Mark, let me send it over to you. Uh, what was your take uh, on Rose's win and, and on the fight as a whole? Yeah, so first off, great win for Rose. Super happy for her. I love I love Rose. She really gutted it out and clearly won rounds four and five to make sure she kept her belt in what was a close fight 
prior to those two, two rounds. Um, when I was watching live, I felt just like you through rounds one and two. I, I, they both ended and I was like, well, I have zero clue what just happened in, in, that, in yeah. that round. Um, I did think that Whaley won three. And then I thought four and five were, were clearly Rose's. So when it came to the decision, I was like, well, Rose must have got one of those first two. Like, I hope she gets this decision. And she did. And I was happy. Okay. Then I rewatched the fight. And yeah, oh. I'm pretty positive Whaley won all three of the first rounds. Oh, wow. Uh, like, I, I'd love to rewatch it again. I'm actually pissed because when you buy a pay-per-view, you're supposed to have it for 15 days. And I went to rewatch it again today and I didn't have it anymore. And it was asking me if I wanted to buy it again. So I was like, I don't think that's true. What is that about? If you Google it, it's every link says you have it for 15 days. I have only known it to have it for 24 hours. Exactly. Really? Google it it right now. Every link says 15 days. But is it that like within 15 days, you get to watch it once? Oh, maybe. Well, I watched it twice already. So it's not bad. There you go. Maybe you get to watch one replay. I don't, I don't know. But yeah. anyway so yeah i'm pissed i couldn't watch it one more time but on my one rewatch i like pretty clearly had rounds one to three four way wow. um and for what it's worth i went on mma decisions to see how other people scored it 86.2 percent of people gave way lee round one 72.7 percent of people gave way lee round two and 85 percent of people gave way lee round three. Oh wow so that is pretty clear. What website um, is this? Huh? What website is this? MMA Decisions. Oh, cool. It's, it's that website that um, compiles all the media scores. So you can see how everybody scored it. Wow. But then you can also, if there's a place to score it yourself. And if you score it yourself and submit your own scorecard, it then shows you the world's submissions. And that's what I'm referring to right now. Oh, wow. The media was pretty split, if I remember right. Like they kind of had it half and half, 48, 47 each, each way. Um. But uh, yes, what was I going to say? That, so yeah, I feel for Wei Lee. I don't mind that Rose won though because I, I do kind of feel like pride rules she won the fight because four and five were clear, especially five. Mm. So I kind of like that, that she's still champ, but I just, when I rewatched, I was like, wow, that was a little different than I thought it would. Uh, I mean, than I thought it went. Um, one thing I just want to say that I really hated was Rogan saying oh there there's really no one else for rose to fight in this division like hmm. he loves throwing that out there he does it all the time and it, it makes me nuts at times like carlos Sparza is ready and waiting marina rodriguez looks great tisha torres is hot right now amanda hebus and mackenzie Dern are coming up like the list goes on there's plenty of girls in that division i don't know why we're like bashing divisions for no reason being like well after this fight there's nothing else for rose to do like that's absolutely not true i don't, I don't know why we're doing that so that annoys the shit out of me but anyway great fight close fight i do feel for way lee because now it's 2-0 it's going to be hard for her to ever get a third shot at rose maybe uh she's got to hope the belt changes hands but yeah way lee's right there it, it could certainly happen if, if she got another shot but but uh happy for rose she she's a great champ yeah man uh speaking of matchups let's talk about way lee uh omar let me go back to you where do you see way lee matching up at strawweight next if not uh, running it back with Rose again. I mean, at this point, Mariana just, or Marina, Marina, Marina Rodriguez, uh, just had her win. I think it was a couple of weeks ago, or a week ago. I can't even remember what the days are anymore at this point. Uh, but I, I would honestly love to see that fight against uh, her and Wei Li. I think that'd be a great testament to see exactly where she's at. If she's at that championship caliber. And if she is, if she wins that fight, give her Rose. I would love to see Marina against Rose. It would be a great stand up fight. Mark, what about you? Yeah, I feel the same as Omar. So in, in terms of Rose, I really hope they go Esparza. I think yes. she's earned it. Next, yes. And it, it's kind of leading into my answer of, of Wei Li. That's why I'm doing this one first. But I, I really hope they make Rose and Esparza. I think she's absolutely earned it. I don't love Dana saying in the post fight, he was like, well, you sh- I don't like when people sit. It's not what you should do. Because you could tell he was talking, referring to Esparza because they asked him who's next for, for Rose. So I hope he doesn't pull any bullshit. You can't give it to Rodriguez because Esparza just beat her like two yeah. fights ago. Yeah. So I don't know who else you'd give it to. Esparza beat Rose to win the title in the in the start of this division. You have the storyline there of Rose trying to get that back. I, it's so obvious. I, I really hope that's what they do. 
So assuming that's what happens, then I'm with Omar, but I'll throw another name in there. I think there's three girls. There's Whaley, Rodriguez, and Joanna coming back. Two of those three girls got to fight each other. And I kind of think that Marina Rodriguez needs to be in the fight no matter what, because she's the one who is on a win streak. So I feel like it should be Marina versus either one of them for kind of that title eliminator spot. Okay. Awesome. You guys want to move on? Anything else you want to say about Thug Rose? Thug Rose! Okay. Love it. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the lightweight division. This fight was supposed to be the fight before the co-main, but for logistical reasons with the Trevor Whitman camp, this fight was moved up to the opener of the main card. So in the lightweight division, Justin Gaethje defeated Michael Chandler by unanimous decision, and the scores read as follows, 29-28, 29-28, and 30-27, all in favor of the highlight, Justin Gaethje, defeating Iron Michael Chandler. Mark, let me start with you. Man, oh man, what a fight. I mean, this fight was dynamite on paper, and man, they delivered. What's your reaction? Holy shit, what a fight. I, you cannot deliver on hype more than those guys delivered on hype. God. That fight is immediately up there as one of the best and craziest fights we've ever seen. They literally both went out there and started swinging for knockout blows from the jump. And never stopped. They were just like, we're not <laughs> going to do anything. We'll throw some calf kicks. But other than that, we're just trying <laughs> to take each, each other's head off. Um, shout out Trevor Whitman for going 3-0. Before I forget to say that, coach of the year. What a night for that, for that Give man. It to him. Give it to him now. Um, exactly how that fight went is exactly why I picked Justin Gaethje. He's just more comfortable in the fire. He thrives in the fire. He lives for that war and he's just at his best in it. You, it, you cannot beat Justin Gaethje in, in that style of fight unless you're Dustin Poirier. Um, and if it happened again, I don't even know if, if Poirier could do it. Gaethje's an animal. Um, these guys probably both up their stock uh, in the eyes of a lot of fans. And of course, Chandler, you know, he upped his stock for, for me too. I, sh I shouldn't say he didn't. The, the heart on that dude, the balls on that dude to just uh, continue the, the, the way he was continuing, asking for more was incredible, super memorable. Yeah, we'll never forget that, that those moments for, for Michael Chandler, even though it was a loss. But at the same time, I feel like I have a bit of an alternative take uh, that I want to point out. Watching live, that fight, of course, felt crazy. And, you know, you still Ch Chandler was in it the whole time he was landing his shots and you still felt like anyone could land a bomb at any minute, but on the rewatch, yes, of course, Chandler was stupid tough and he had so much heart, but I kind of think he got worked. Like, I honestly feel like he looked like a mix of like good Michael Chandler and Chris Matinho. Like if you, if you, <laughs> if you really think about it, wow. so many of Chandler's moments in that fight were him getting cracked in his face and being like, give me more of that. Like that, all the like, oh my God, this is crazy moments. Other than the first one, Chandler cracks Gaethje. Was Chandler surviving just getting beaten on? Yeah. So to me, like, again, I don't want to take anything away from Chandler. It was incredible. The guy was just part of one of the, one of the greatest fights ever. And, and it was because of his heart. But I... I feel like, so I, I scored that 30, 26 for Justin. I gave him the first round. Cause I thought he poured it on so much a, after getting wobbled second round. I thought it was 10, eight, 10, nine. I thought was Justin. So I feel like it just showed to me what a different level. Justin Gaethje is on that, that, than Michael Chandler. Omar, what's your take? Do you yeah. compare him to Chris Moutinho? Oh no, that's so mean. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. My cousin is so mad at me right now because I, I shared like kind of a version of that take with him, Tommy, that was on our podcast. Uh -huh. And he, and he was like, don't you dare go on there and bash Michael Chandler after what he just did. <laughs> it was a, listen, that has to definitely be one of the top five greatest fights I've ever seen. Um, and I think what makes that fight, even though Gaethje was fairly dominant in that fight for all three rounds. Okay. Thank you. Thank he you. was, he was You're dominant right. for sure. 
Okay. I had it. I had it thirty twenty seven again. I didn't do the ten eight, but I I'm not mad at you for it. Um, Chandler didn't win any any of those rounds, but God damn it, if Chandler is an animal and was fighting the oh, whole sure. time, the the fact that he got up from that knockdown and was still throwing with power says more than enough about that kid's cardio. There's I'm sure there's holes. In, in, in his game, obviously, that, that Justin was able to exploit, especially when it comes to the striking. I told you guys that the takedown shit was not going to matter when it came to that side of things. Justin is not. It was Khabib. Well, to be clear, I said that it had to get to the ground for it to matter and that there was a strong chance Chandler couldn't get him there. I said only if he could get him there would it matter. So I, it's not like I thought he was just taking him down. So. Yeah, taking him down is never going to be a thing that I would – I would bank on when it comes to Justin Gaethje. That kid is, he's wily. He's very averse to ever yeah. hitting the canvas. Yeah. But it was, dude, it was such a, fa- I, I mean, I was screaming. I was screaming the entire oh. time for the entire 15 <clears throat> minutes. First of all, the fact that that went 15 minutes is crazy. Crazy. Second of all, fuck them for not making that five rounds. I know, dude. I know. But oh just, Chandler might've died if that was five he rounds. He would have. I, I think he would have eventually gotten finished. I mean, the first if, round was very competitive. If he dies, he dies. Then we have some finality there, boys. The first round was very competitive. And Chandler did some work in that first round. But the second yeah, and did. third round, Gaethje's, uh, you know, the talent differential, Gaethje just kept pulling away and just kept pouring it on Chandler. And Chandler definitely, he just got, he got kind of caught up in the tough guy act. 100%. And he, stopped, he stopped throwing. In no way was that how Michael Chandler should have fought that fight. I like, really think a lot yeah. of it had to do with damage because that happened after he got knocked down. I think he was really trying to recover, hmm. trying Maybe. to like work, you know, sure. try, trying to trying to deal with everything that was going on. I can't imagine he was okay after that that knockdown. Yeah, it's true. that well, was the first round he did uppercut. fight it looking like Michael Chandler. So maybe you're right because it was the latter two rounds where you were like. This is how Chandler's opting to go about this. Like, dude, the uppercut lifted him off the ground. Like, his oh, yeah, feet it did. Were off yeah. the ground. His mouth was destroyed after that. I mean, he was he was not okay. He was yeah. not okay. Did you see by any chance the video he posted to Instagram today with the blue ice thing on his face? Blue no. ice thing? What are you talking? Is that about? like a mask? Blue ice pack mask thing. So, first of all, it's super funny. You you should watch it. He he's a funny dude sometimes, but um. At the very start of it, he's like, he's with his son, and he's like, "Yeah, daddy made a lot of stupid decisions in a fight on Saturday, or something like that." So you could tell even he is kind of like, "Man, yeah. I I was an idiot." Yeah, for sure. But uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big Michael Chandler fan, man. I think he's a super charismatic guy. He seems to have a great head on head on his shoulders. He seems to be a great dude, and you know, he's he's 35 already, so. However many years he has left fighting, I think he's going to have a very long career ahead of him, either commentating or, or doing oh, something sure. on camera. Oh, he's, 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 so speaking. he's such a great speaker. He's, he's yeah. great on camera. I can easily see him slotting into uh, being a color commentator role, yeah. either at the UFC or, or anywhere else and, and killing it. That being sure. said, uh, another thing to, that I want to say about Chandler, just to give him some respect, he must be pretty frustrated right now that two fights back to back at the top of the UFC light di- uh, lightweight division. He in in the first round of each fight, the first one being against Charles Oliveira yeah. and this one being against Justin Gaethje, he came so close to finishing both of those guys, and he's like, Jesus, what do I have to do? I mean, he was moments away was... from being from defeating Charles Oliveira and yes. being the UFC lightweight champion. Yeah, I don't know if moments I'm say he was away. close to finishing Gaethje. He had Gaethje in real trouble, though. He, he rocked, rocked, he rocked Gaethje, but at least. Here's the thing about, he, rocked he rocked him. him. I don't know that he was about close Justin to Gaethje. finishing him. You got to do a lot to finish Justin Gaethje. There, yes, exactly. There, about Justin Gaethje, there are few men and women in the UFC who can take a punch like Justin Gaethje. A very few come to mind. Marvin Vittori comes to mind. Uh, Piotr Jan comes to mind uh, of, in terms of like recency bias. But my God. Justin Gaethje can get hit with a, with a tank and he will not leave his feet. It is unbelievable to see what the kind of damage this guy can absorb. The crazy thing about Justin Gaethje is like when you, when you talk about Marvin Vittori, Marvin Vittori is a tank. He gets hit with shit and just goes forward, whether it hurts him or not. It doesn't yeah. actually affect him. Yes. Justin Gaethje is a human being. 
oh, who is getting him. hit with things and reacting how most people would react <laughs> by stumbling around the ring, like not able to walk like properly and still throwing punches. Like, it's almost like he needs crazy. to stumble to properly plant for the uppercut. Like, <laughs> like he, he is a zombie. Like, there was is... a moment in that fight it went when he got rocked that I thought we were about to see like one of those Czech Congo moments because he was up against. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. For dear life. And I thought he was going to crack with uh, Chandler with one of those things. He's like a cross between Vittori and, and Tony Ferguson. He's like yeah. a, such a zombie slash tank of a guy. It's un, it's such a, it's like an unfair advantage. A guy as powerful as a Michael Chandler. It's like, what do I have to do? How many times do I have to punch this guy in the face? Yeah. Unbelievable. Can you imagine this man that we're talking about right now that put on that performance on Saturday, looking at him, and being like, eh, I know a guy who could walk through him pretty easy in like seven minutes. And that's how good Habib is. Yeah, man. Crazy. That's crazy. The, I mean, the, crazy. The, the coldest shit in the world is making the decision in the fight to not break his arm in front of his parents. So he triangled him anyway. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. that's cold shit. And I used to not be like a huge Habib guy but as th the more time goes on the more i feel like i'm like god that guy was fucking unreal <laughs> yeah man also i mean stylistically it's you know styles make fights and just those russian yeah. fighters, man oh, yeah. it's a different kind of wrestling it just is speaking it's of russian shame. fighters the ufc can go right ahead and book that islam versus darush fight because justin gaethje is fighting for the goddamn title yeah, i don't care awesome. if it's poirier you book that again you ain't taking the title shot away from oh. that man oh, after yeah. what he just did on Saturday. We riot. There's nobody else. There's nobody else. Um, oh, there's Islam. That's what I'm saying. That's what, that was the debate. So that's the perfect segue. You know, I, I'm guessing that's your answer for where, where does Gaethje go next? I'm, oh, yes. I, I'm guessing you would agree. So let's it talk is. about real quick. Uh, uh, let's talk about Michael Chandler. Where do you see him going? At lightweight. Who do you want to lead it off? While I'm already talking, I'll lead it off. <laughs> so he threw out Connor today, which I don't, I don't know if you guys saw. Um, we might have actually talked about it in the group chat, which is cool. That's a cool idea. Um, Connor seemed interested. Um, only problem is Connor's still not back for a while, and I'm not sure Chandler's trying to wait that long or if he realizes how long Connor's out for. So if that's not happening, then the kind of sexy options are a little less um, cause they're all in, in, involved in fights. But um, I think that Rafael Dos Anjos could make some sense and could be a pretty cool matchup and fight. And mm -hmm. then even if you didn't want to do that, I feel like you could get a little cuter and maybe do Gregor Gillespie, give him a big chance would honestly be a cool fight too. I would really be interested to see how that played out. Um, but yeah, I've, there, I mean, there's a lot that would work with, with Michael Chandler, his style, like, it's almost like his style because he's such a good wrestler. When he needs to be, he can sub guys. He can bang with guys. He can like, you can almost put that style across from any name. I name. And you're going to be mm -hmm. like, Oh, it's a sick matchup. You know what I mean? So he he's, he's pretty easy to book a fight for. It's a great point. Omar, what about you? What do you think? I'd be interested to see him against Sonny Ferguson. Not sure what's on his Ooh. plate right now. I don't think he's got Sonny. anything going on. He's been doing a lot of tweeting. I like it. Um, I'd be interested to see that fight. See what Tony Ferguson's actually up. Uh, you know, what his, his level is at this point. I didn't say him because I still like your Hooker Ferguson idea from last week so much. So I didn't want to touch that. I just I'm, I'm so interested to see where where Ferguson is, man. Like yeah, his last of couple performances, it's one thing to lose, and it's another thing to get your ass beat. And he's gotten his ass beat in his last two performances. Yeah, yeah. I kind of think that he should be fighting someone more like Hooker than someone like Chandler. Like I, Chandler feels like a lot, but I don't know. Maybe totally. we're wrong. Mm. All right, let's move on. Unless you guys have anything else to say about the highlight, Justin Gaethje. No, sir. Okay, in the men's bantamweight division, Marlon Chito Vera defeated Frankie the Answer Edgar by knockout via uh, front kick at three minutes and 50 seconds of round number three. Omar, shaking your head, I'm going to start with you. What did you make of this performance from Chito Vera? So when we did, we did our picks last week, I, I picked Chito Vera to win. Um, I picked him by decision, and that was really just because, like, I really don't want Frankie to keep getting knocked out. I really don't. Yeah, to the head. It is, it is, as much as I like Chito Vera and want him to do well and want him to see a belt, you know, with him with the belt at some point, that was just a really painful 
fight for me to watch. Um, he got, I mean, Frank Yeager got Vitor Belfort right in the face, right in the face. And it just, you know, he was, he was protesting the stoppage. His whole body gave out. <laughs> yeah. His whole body gave out. Yeah. He went right to the floor. I mean, uh, yeah. To, to let that go on would have just been more continuously unanswered punches to Frankie's head Oh yeah, would have been unnecessary is probably the lightest word I could use. So yeah, I, I'm glad the fight was stopped when it was um, Frankie Edgar though, to be fair, was winning that fight. Clearly. I thought um, until he, he got, thing. He was I thought, thing. I thought he was winning that fight. I thought you he had done. It, you points. didn't have it one, one, you had it two up. I, well, in the third. I mean, that that kick didn't come until much later. I thought he was winning oh, the third. Oh, I thought you meant home. that he was, like, winning the whole time. Yeah, no. I, I had a 1-1 going into the third. But I had the third yeah, yeah, winning, yeah. Uh, going for, for Frankie up until gotcha. he got kicked in the face. Yeah. Mm. But, yeah. And Frankie has – he's been knocked out four times since 2018. Ortega yeah, – After, like, never being knocked out. Ever. Yeah, Ortega uppercutted him yep. from hell and took him off his feet. That was nasty. Chan yep. Sung Jung knocked him out, TKO'd him. Corey flying Corey was, his head into, uh, you know, next year. And, that was the bad one. And Cheeto just front kicked him in the chin. The Corey one was the one that, that that might be the one that that popped the top as far as his oh, chin is concerned. Man. Yeah, I don't think you really heal from that kind of one. That's that's That was a bad one. That was an, that was an all-time great knockout. It, yeah. it was. Yeah, I mean it was great. It's great. It's a great highlight one, but like Frankie not was against sweet. Frankie, not against sweet. Frankie, not against our boy. I know. I know. All right, Mark, what is your take on uh, Chito Vera getting this <clears throat> great win over the legend Frankie Edgar? Yeah, I came out of that fight sad, no matter what, just like I knew I would be. Um, it certainly looks like the time of Frankie having a chance at the top has passed here. Uh, this was the fight where it, it kind of became the most clear to me. Like the zombie and Sanhagen fights were over so quick that you couldn't 100% tell. And he did beat Pedro Munoz in between. So it was kind of like, you know what? Maybe Frankie still has it. But he, this fight, I feel like you could see it. He's a guy that relies so heavily on his ability to pop in and out of range, like at lightning speed, both for his striking and for his takedowns, especially because he's almost always a smaller guy. And it was obvious watching this fight that Frankie can't close range nearly as fast anymore as he always has and unfortunately that that's a bit of a death sentence for a guy like him um against top level competition at least and you can see it that like mm. the skills are still there like omar said like he's he's kind of winning the fight like it's right there it's just that it's it's missing like the thing is missing that made frankie frankie um yeah. and and i i fear things like this are going to keep happening first of all quick side note frankie edgar is such a fucking gangster it is mind-blowing, mind-blowing to watch Frankie Edgar, who was the 155-pound champion, and then fought all these fights at 145, fighting at 135 and being hugely smaller than Marlon Vera. And Marlon Vera's not even a big bantamweight. Like, it's cr crazy how, like, is Frankie Edgar smaller than Mighty Mouse? Like, can I see them side by side? How small is Frankie Edgar? Like, I saw, I saw a backstage photo of uh, Frankie Edgar standing in between, I think, Usman and Gaethje. And yeah. I had a very similar thought. I was like, holy shit, Frankie Edgar was the 155-pound champ, and Justin Gaethje fights at 155. And did and he look like, like it looks like David and Goliath. Yeah, I don't – it's, it's mind-blowing. Is he shrinking? Like, I don't, I don't understand this. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I, I still – thought Frankie had had a chance because I didn't think that Marlon Vera was a KO threat. So like I said, I thought maybe Frankie could still like eke it out. Little did I know that Marlon Vera was going to go full Anderson Silva front kick on Vitor Belfort and kick Frankie Edgar's freaking face off. Like, have, have you seen the picture that's going around today yeah. of Frankie's face? Yeah. Oh my God. It looks like he aged 30 years in one second of a kick. It's one of the craziest pictures. I thought it was Photoshopped when I first saw it. It's because his skull moved like two inches up and it left oh his face behind. Oh my God, man. But yeah, what a KO. I'm so happy for Marlon Vera. I, I love that guy. He deserves his time to shine. And you cannot ask for a breakthrough moment much bigger than front kicking Frank Yeager's face off in Madison Square Garden. I mean, I know that the UFC rankings had Frankie at Bantamweight at number eight. 
and Cheeto Vera at 13. I'm curious to find out two things, where you had them and where you have Cheeto now. But we'll get to that when we get to the pre-ranking. So okay. uh, uh, do you guys have anything else you want to say about where you see these guys going next? Or you want to move on? Yeah, I'll, I'll say something on that. Um, for Frankie, honestly, I, I wouldn't mind if he called it. It feels like that's not what's going to happen. Granted, I haven't heard him speak since this fight. So who knows? Maybe getting KO'd again. Maybe he's like, shit. I don't know. Um, if he's not going to call it, I think the best option and one that would be a maximizing of, of Frank Yeager right now is if, and this, you know, it would have to play out this way for this to work. But if Pedro Munoz beats Dominic Cruz, I think you go Frankie Dominic Cruz because at least Dom's not going to knock him out. That fight still sells, hugely marketable. I would still love to see it as a fan, and, and you have a great fight. If Cruz beats Munoz, you can't really book that, in my opinion, because mm. uh, Frankie's on a losing streak. I don't I don't think it makes as much sense. Um, but if you can make that fight, I, I think you make that fight. I think that's kind of the perfect guy that, that Frankie should be fighting right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, as for Vera, I mean, he has really jumped himself into a huge spot. Um, last week, we were saying that Corey Sandhagen – could probably either fight the loser of Aldo Font or fight Marab. And if it's me, I say let him fight the Aldo Font loser, and I'm making Marlon Vera versus Marab. I think that fight is fucking crazy. Oof. Yeah, that is. That is. Omar, what are you saying? Looking at Ben and Wait. That was literally the fight I wanted to watch was Marlon okay. Vera versus Marab. That's love it. That fight, that fight is basically who's gonna quit first. And neither one of those guys quit. So I can only imagine how crazy that fight is gonna get. Yeah. That's a sick one. And I, I would love for that to headline a fight night and be five rounds too. That'd be dope. If we want to oh, yeah. really oh, yeah. be, we want to be dicks about it, put it in Colorado or somewhere where there's elevation. <laughs> and, and, and let's just, let's just, let's just see what happens, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let the world burn. Awesome. You guys want to move on? Yeah. All right. Before we hop into our lightning round, I want to hop over to Bellator. This past weekend also, uh, at Bellator 270 in the main event, Patricky Pitbull defeated Peter Queeley. He got a TKO victory over him at round number two at one minute and five seconds. Omar, let me start with you. What were your reactions of uh, Patricky Pitbull getting this nice TKO victory? It was a great fight. Um, I mean, it was really impressive from Patricky. He was very effective with striking. He basically caught him, didn't stay off of him like most of the time the, Patricky, the, the Pitbull brothers do. And just like their namesake pretty much went to town on them until he just went down. Yeah, man. Great, Mark, great performance. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, what was your take on, on Pitbull swarming Queely and getting this TKO? Tricky Pitbull is finally the Bellator lightweight champion. Mm-hmm. It has been a long time. The guy has been in Bellator since 2011. He has fought 23 times for the promotion and it had kind of started to feel like he was never reaching the top of this division um, obviously he needed some guys to leave like Chandler leaving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but he finally has his belt. Um, the fight went kind of how I thought that fight was going to go the first time it happened. The first time it was shockingly competitive to me. I still think I had Pitbull ahead, but then the cut happened and obviously they stopped it and, and Quilly got the W. Um, but this was a lot more what I expected to see. I, I thought Pip, Pipple would be able to kind of just put it on him and, and use that power and, and superior striking. And it's exactly what he did. And, you know, I don't want to make it sound like Pitbull is some hugely elite fighter because he's not. He's, you could argue there's 20 lightweights in the UFC that you'd pick over Pitbull. But you could also argue that he could catch a lot of dudes, potentially. He he has, he is a real, like, knockout king as the shirt he was wearing that said KO King. If he hits you clean, it's trouble. So, the guy's had a great career. He's put on a lot of entertaining fights, and it, um, I'm happy to see him be able to, to finally carry around some gold. It, it kind of feels right for as long as he's been in Bellator and kind of been in his brother's shadow that, that now he gets to be a champ himself. And if I had to guess, he's probably going to have to defend it against Brett Primus. So mm-hmm. that'll be an interesting one, kind of the, uh, the knockout guy versus the crafty as hell uh, BJJ practitioner. Definitely, definitely. All right, gentlemen, let us now – hop into our lightning round our non game show game show baked into the middle of our podcast here 
where I'm going to run down some more fights from UFC 268 and one other one from Bellator 270. And just give these, guys, uh, give these to you guys uh, in a lightning round format, asking you to give me your one sentence take on each of these outcomes. I need to say something right now. Please. The, there are so many big fights in here that need to be discussed. I feel like we need to make this like a double length lightning round. Like saying okay, two one sentence. sentences. Okay. Two, like I, two I'm sentences. I'm probably going to still say like three or four. God damn um, it. I, it's, it, there's such big fights. Like I can't. Oh, let's just do it. All right. Here we go with the <laughs> lightning round. That was the sound cue. Okay. UFC 268, Shane Burgos, unanimous right. decision over Billy Q, Billy Quarantillo. Omar, go first. What a crazy ass fight. I told you though, don't sleep on Shane Burgos. Bad man. Mm -hmm. Mark Burgos over Billy Q. What do you think? Yeah, this is a fight that would have got showered with love if it was on any other card. But because it was on the night that it was on, it's almost already been forgotten about. But these two dudes went to war. Billy Q refused to die even on one leg. He fought round three, how I wish every losing fighter would fight round three, and that he tried every damn tactic he could to find a way, which which was awesome to see. But Burgos was a different different level, like we suspected he may be, and he was just better at this stage of their careers. Much anticipated the UFC middleweight debut of Alex Pereira, who defeated Andres Mikolaitis by TKO by nasty, nasty flying knee. It was really a thing of beauty. Mark, go first. Pereira looked as good as he possibly could have looked. He defended takedowns. He showed defensive grappling. He did fine in the clinch. And he got the spectacular highlight reel KO that is his calling card on top of it all. So you really can't ask for him to show more than what he did in his debut to kind of answer some questions. And he has Izzy already saying his name that he'd like to fight him it's today. I think I saw that. So the plan is certainly in motion. Omar. Israel Adesanya's only knockout is finally now in the UFC in the middleweight division. Alex Pereira earns a spectacular uh, knockout victory in his UFC debut. What do you think? I think he looked great. Um, I think Mikali just played it wrong, to be honest. I think he tried to completely grapple him and completely try to out-wrestle him and, and, and take him to the ground and submit him. <clears throat> and I think he was worried, obviously, and I guess rightfully so, about the striking. But the problem is, is that he gassed himself basically trying to muscle his way to the ground for an entire round. And once he got there, it just he wasn't really able to do much. So um, I don't really think he played it right. I think he, he, he expended his energy wrong. Um, and I think Pareto was able to take at full advantage of it. And I think the knee was the cost. Here we go at lightweight. Bobby Green, Bobby King Green defeated Raging Al I Quinta by TKO at two minutes and 25 seconds of round number one. Omar, go first. I love Al. I think most of us picked Al, but I think I think it might, I think it might be that time for him to just just sell some houses, make your money, <laughs> and let's let's move on. That wasn't the wasn't his greatest performance. It's obviously been a while since he's been back. But I also, to be honest, I, I question his commitment to the game at this point versus other people who are in the game like Bobby Green. Mm. Bobby Green's not taking time to sell houses. Bobby Green is in the gym. So, Mark, Bobby Green, TKO is raging out. What's your take? So maybe most of us picked out, but your boy picked Bobby Green. <laughs> my, my only error on that, on that card was, was Frankie, which might have been a hard pick. But, uh, yeah, freaking wow. Wow. I am so happy for Bobby Green. What a huge moment for him. He's such a great fighter. He's put on so many shows for us over the years, and he just always felt like a guy who deserved to have a big moment like this and just didn't have it on his resume, and now he has it. Yeah. Watching him, I'm like, damn, Bobby Green is really good. He is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Chris Curtis, first round knockout over Phil Hawes. Mark, take this one first. What a strange fight to break down. You have Phil Hawes looking incredible, incredible for 95% of it, like easily the best striking we've ever seen from him. And then you have Chris Curtis finishing him for 5% of it or less. So weird fight. It's almost like you want to say, wow, Hawes looks better than ever, but then he lost. So either way, incredible debut for Chris Curtis, who, as he mentioned, has been on the outskirts of the UFC for a long time. 
kind of scratch and trying to get in. And he finally does. And he does it in friggin' style. I think he's here to stay now. Omar, what is your take on Chris Curtis and his middleweight debut in the UFC, getting a big win over a fairly big prospect in uh, Phil Haas? Yeah, it's uh, another one in the, in the books for Phil Haas as, a, as an L. Um, it's not really looking for good for him as far as his initial career here. Um, but Chris Curtis did what he had to do. Um, it sounded like he was looking for an opportunity to land that punch for quite some time. And when he found the opening, he landed it, walks home with a W. Nazardine first loss in the UFC. Be easy on my guy. <laughs> Nazardine Imavov, round two, TKO over Edmund Shabazian Omar. Take this one first. Wow, was I wrong? No, I was not wrong about this one. <laughs> I was not wrong about this one. This was not the one I was wrong about. Imavov did exactly what I thought he was going to do to Shabazian. And he took him down. And he just baby rode him until he broke his face open. I'm I'm just concerned about where, where Edmund goes from here personally, but good showing by Imavov. Mark, Imavov gets the win over Shabazian TKO. What's your take? Yeah, that Edmund rocket ship really was like one of the quicker launches and descents that you, that you can think of. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, that went about how I imagined it was going to go. Uh, Edmund is good, but he still looks like such an unfinished product out there. Whereas Imavov is like the picture of calm. Like you can't rattle him. He looks like he's in his 1,000th fight. Yeah, The guy's a problem. I, I really like him. I, I'm super curious to see who he fights next. Here we go. The takeover part two. Ian Gary, round one knockout over Jordan Williams. Mark, go. So I guess every European cage warrior star that comes over to the UFC is just going to leave their defense over in Europe because both Patty and him just debuted by looking extremely dreadful defensively. Um, So yeah, it was a little bit of a rough look for a second, but then Ian Gary gets the beautiful timed KO. He cuts the perfect promo and here we go. Trains in motion. It was the perfect promo. Omar, take this one. Ian Gary, uh, spectacular win in his debut over Jordan Williams. Yeah, solid performance. Um, If we're being honest, though, I don't really know what I'm supposed to take away from that fight. Jordan Williams isn't anybody to really uh, set any kind of bar or or give me any kind of real information as to how that was going to go. If anything, it's it concerns me that that Ian Gary took the shots that he did, um, but it was impressive. I, I will say the finish itself was super impressive that that step back and step mm-hmm. forward it it in my I, I would assume to most people that looks maybe fairly easy or or at the very minimum cool that shit is hard to time that moment to time the back and the forward and all that weight that goes on your back foot to then spring forward is very very difficult to do and to do well and to do effectively and he did it and he made it look super easy and it's skill for skill. He looks like he's, he's the real deal. Yeah. He's got to clean up that defense though. Okay. Here we go with the heavyweights. One of my new favorite guys, <laughs> beast boy, Chris Barnett, second round TKO over John Vellante. Omar, take this one first. What are they feeding that boy? <laughs> I mean, he, he really, he really, pulled out a spinning back kick and won. I think yeah, Gian Vellante didn't even know. He looked disappointed that he didn't even know that that was an option <laughs> to be thrown in that fight. Um, we do we do need to mention Gian Vellante, frankly, looked awful in that fight. He did not look like he was in shape. It didn't even look like yeah, he knew man, he was yeah. fighting that night until like <laughs> three nights before. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it Again, another one of those moments where I'm not really sure what I was supposed to take away as far as a competitive standpoint, but I can take away that uh, this Chris Barnett kid can throw some kicks. Apparently, Taekwondo is very much in his repertoire, so absolutely, definitely one to look out for. Mark, uh, what's your take on Chris Barnett ruining the retirement party of John Vellante? Yeah, man, Chris Barnett, how much fun is that going to be? Like, oh for a God. big guy to move the way that he does and to finish a fight like that with a spinning wheel kick, and celebrate the way he did like that guy is must see tv and then i also want to mention how he gave one of the most gracious post-fight interviews i've ever seen yes he treated Jan Vellante 
like he was a freaking legend retiring. Like he was Chuck Liddell. Like, <laughs> but hey, nice, super nice guy. Super nice guy. All right, let's go hop over back to Bellator 270 real quick. In the Bellator co-main event, Patchy Mix, one of my favorite names to say in combat sports, round three sub over James Gallagher. Mark, take this one first. Yeah, this was a great matchup of two of the top young bantamweights in Bellator. Uh, I do want to say it is a shame for Bellator that James Gallagher didn't win because, Hmm. my God, that guy is a star in Ireland. Like, I didn't know he was a star like that. That was one of the coolest walkouts I have ever seen in my life of watching MMA. Like any organization, bar none. They treated that dude like he was a giant. Hmm. So maybe watch the walkout. Unfortunately, he does not win the fight. Um, It was as if these two guys made a bet ahead of time of who could catch the other in a guillotine because it was like a guillotine party in there. They both just kept going for it. Um, They're both grapplers, obviously, but it was Mix who was suspected to be the better grappler going in, and it was Mix who proved that uh, on Friday, tapping him out in the third. Omar, uh, Patchy Mix gets it done over James Gallagher. Take it. Yeah, I mean, it definitely looked like both of them wanted to play the ground game and, and really solidify who was better at it. I'm assuming there was some shit talk leading up to that moment about who was the better grappler or perhaps I'm a, I could choke you out or whatever. The fact is they both went in there. They threw some shots here and there, but for the most part, they were really looking to, to, to submit one another and, and solidify that moment. So um, having looked at the fight, it, it did seem like Mix had a significant advantage in the grappling game. Um, he was a lot better at the chain submissions. Whenever he didn't get one, he was definitely moving to the next, uh, the next stage as opposed to kind of settling on the ground or kind of giving up position. He was always in, in control, even when he was on the bottom. So it was, it was a very interesting fight. Um, and it was a very quick tap when you really look at, at, at kind of how that third round started. So um, kind of a shame for James Gallagher. I'm, 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 I was very interested to see kind of what came of his, of his Bellator run there. Um, Cause I think he was on a five fight win streak before this, or was this going to be five? Oh, I don't remember exactly, but he's been hot. Is he's at, definitely had at least four wins straight recently. Yeah. Um, so it, I was gonna, I was interested to see exactly who's gonna make of it, but fell short. Thank you, gentlemen. And thus concludes our lightning round. Hey, congrats to John Volante for a nice career. I mean, the dude is always gonna carry his memories with him that he was a UFC heavyweight for a number of years and he was always kind of in the mix, had a bunch of nice fights and uh, congrats to him. All right. Let us now remind our audience, please like, and subscribe to this video on YouTube. If you're into audio only find us wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, join the conversation on social media, tweet at us. If you agree, if you disagree, especially at and new underscore MMA show in all the places. And now let us put a bow on UFC 267 by finding out from Mr. Prio who has risen and who has fallen in our very own Prio rankings. Mark, take it away. So we got a lot of action this week. Uh, A lot of, a lot of big events on this card. So I will start with guys who were not ranked and who have jumped themselves into the rankings. We had, we had three pretty big debuts. Um, One was Ian Gary, obviously uh, not ranked debuting. Uh, knockout win inserts himself into the welterweight rankings at number 59, obviously still ranked low, but the journey has begun. Mm-hmm. Alex Pereira, kind of the same deal comes in, not ranked. He's now my number 50 uh, middleweight and his potential to rise possibly quickly uh, begins. The crazy one is the debuting Chris Curtis who knocks out Phil Hawes, who I have entering my rankings as the number 15 middleweight, which wow. is pretty wild kind of off the back of the fact. So I'll mention one more before I explain this. So another one who moved up was Nasruddin Imavov, who I had as my number 21 middleweight. He's now my number 17 middleweight. So Imavov kind of continues this steady rise up the ranks. And Phil Hawes was undefeated and had beaten, undefeated in the UFC and had beaten Imavov. So I had, I have Mm -hmm. Hawes ranked above him. And now Chris Curtis steps in and knocks out Phil Hawes. So I, I kind of don't see any way to not rank Curtis so highly right out of the gate. So he's my number 15 middleweight. Wow. Um, 
So a mob of up to 17, like I said, Hawes is 16, if you could deduce that. Um, one more smaller one is Chris Barnett, who we just talked about. I had him ranked number 40 at heavyweight. He kind of moves into the mix now, the, the lower end mix. Uh, I have him as a number 29 heavyweight off of that great win. And then the couple that are the more noteworthy jumps. Um, <clears throat> one is Bobby Green. Bobby Green was my number 31 lightweight. And I swear, every time I looked at my rankings, I was like, man, Bobby Green is better than the number 31 lightweight. But I, I got to rank wins and losses. He's got a lot of close losses. You know, I don't have to read, rank the loss as heavily as if he was like knocked out, but it's, it's a loss is a loss. I can't, I can't ignore him. So I always looked at him. I was like, man, he deserves to be higher. And now he's my number 16 lightweight. Ooh, let's off, go off the back of that ally Quinta win. So let's go Bobby King Green. It feels nice to see him up there. I wish I, I wish I could tell him that, that he's kind of where I feel like he belongs now. Uh, so yes, awesome win for him. Um, and the other big move is Marlon Vera. Marlon Vera is a guy who a lot of places kind of already had jumped into the rankings. I had not, he was my number 19 bantamweight. Um, kind of had an up and down record, didn't have a signature win for me to, to make that jump just yet. The Song Yadong fight that he lost was kind of holding him down for me, even though I thought he won that fight. Um, and now he finally has that big win to make the jump. He is now my number six bantamweight in the world. Oh, nice. So, wow, right in the middle of the top 10 at bantamweight. Holy and to answer Lord. your question from before, Mikey, I mean, Mikey, why am I calling you Mikey? Yeah, please. Um, <laughs> um <laughs> I have a different friend who, who goes by Mikey, but, uh, Oh, I think cause I was going to say Frankie, that's what happened in my mind. Oh, there you go. Frankie was my number six band and coming into this. He's now my number eight. Um, nice. and, and very six. So that answers your question from before. And then the one faller, um, on the back of the Bobby green point is ally Quinta. Yeah. Um, he was my number 10 lightweight coming into this. And, it's a t kind of a tough fall for him here, but he hasn't fought much lately. And he was a guy who was kind of hanging on to that ranking for me based on some past accomplishments and based on the crop below him, not really having topped what he had done. But now with Bobby green being in that crop and knocking him out, it kind of lets a lot of guys who have beaten green and, and so on jump him. So ally Quinta moves from my number 10 lightweight to my number 20 lightweight in, in one fight. So kind of a big drop for Al appropriate, appropriate. All right. That's it. That does it for the rankings. That does it. Awesome. Awesome. Let us now hop into our inside the MMA sphere. Omar, what uh, news tidbits do you have for us this week? It's been a little bit since I've given you inside the MMA <laughs> sphere like this. Oh, God. Okay. Welcome back. I can't take it. <sighs> All right. Uh, so real quick, we were just talking about, uh, Gian Vellante, uh, putting his gloves down and, uh, just to give a little bit more context, he's actually going to be pursuing coaching and teaching. Um, that's kind of his, his next pursuit him. in life. He's actually going to also be working on his, uh, few remaining credits on his degree at Hofstra, wow. uh, which I think he's already been working on since June. So um yeah looks like he's got a lot of things lined up after his mma world which i'm kind of glad for um you know he was one of those guys that i don't think he was ever going to get to the top of the mountain necessarily and just he was also a guy that took a lot of damage when he fought so pretty pretty happy that this is the decision he's made i don't think he needs anything else to prove definitely one of the tougher guys and one of the nicer guys in the in the sport um and i hope the best things for him so absolutely agree for sure Next on the list is a fun little story that has no real story behind it, but just a fun fact. Ali Abdelaziz done slap Dylan Dennis in his face backstage at this last UFC event. Apparently, uh, Michael Bisbing found a tweet that Dylan tweeted at him saying something stupid, and Dylan decided to blow his shit up and was like, that's why Ali slapped you in the face at the back oh. of the tweet. And uh, as you know it, Internet blows up from there. So Dylan Dennis kind of gets punked a lot, huh? My God. Oh, well, sure I like I I'm mind. sure I'm sure everybody wants a piece of him now that you know that random security guards can just <laughs> take you down and like submit you. Yeah, valid. Um, he's also like he, he's the cringe that that kid has would make would put Henry to shame. He's <laughs> yeah. the cringe master at this yep. point, and he's not in a good way the worst 
Uh, next on the list, uh, which is our final story for right now, and then we'll get into a couple of the fine announcements, uh, this Triller triad situation here. So Triller has announced uh, like a new format that they're, they're presenting to everybody. It's called the triad. Uh, and basically it is a triangle ring or triangle arena ring ring. it's in the form it is in the shape (laughs) of a triangle why you may ask because that's the only way the word triad probably works uh now the way that this is supposed to work the, the the way they've explained it which is still very weird is it is a combination between mma and boxing where clinching and grappling is allowed no kicks are allowed but it's supposed to even the playing field between boxers and grapplers um i tell you what without any kicks or knee strikes allowed those wrestlers are gonna just eat up any boxers yeah you you can take people down to the ground without any without any fear of a knee I'm going to read you the the little blurb that they have. It is a revolutionary new combat sports team, which incorporates boxing and MMA rules in an aggressive, fast-paced manner with the fighters competing in a specially designed triangular ring over two-minute rounds featuring professional boxers competing against professional mixed martial artists. So with two-minute rounds, the wrestlers don't have a ton of time to go to work. They also don't say how many rounds. Wait, so get to the part about what's allowed. Um, it's basically they're going to use crossover gloves and holding allow- Holding is allowed, and it's meant to offer boxing and MMA fighters an even battleground. Um, they don't look like they have specifics as far as whether you could take people down or not, oh. um, but, you, but it doesn't look like you're allowed to kick. If you can take people down, that's the, then it's the stupid. And you can't kick or knee. The wrestler is going to win every single fight unless it is like the most elite boxer standing across from them that, that can catch them it sounds like ufc won yeah yeah I, it that's sounds exactly dumb sounds. that's exactly right but you know triller gonna be triller, like, gonna, triller gonna triller so it's gonna be like mark coleman coming in when people are like what is this wrestling scenario also the, the co-founder of triller in in selling this idea to people really had the balls to say that ufc is an old sport what what is he talking about? I don't know what you gotta say shit like that when you're trying to. It's only thirty years old. You sport. need to be the new sport. I am offended by that. I Basketball is like one. Uh, I am not old. Basketball is like a hundred years old. Yeah. I yeah. Turned, I turned thirty-five today. I feel old as fuck. Oh, that's right. Happy birthday, Mark! Hey, happy birthday! Mark. I forgot Thanks. to say that earlier. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry, hey, how does it feel? Oh, that was well done. That. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Years of practice, one of those. Pause, years pause, pause this fucking podcast. Mark, <laughs> it's your birthday. I didn't even mean to make it into a thing. It just came out of my mouth that I was 35 because I heard Omar say he was 31. I could care less. Um, <laughs> wait, you literally paused the podcast? No, I don't mean pause. I meant like pause the conversation. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't. I saw the word pause. pause pop up. That's for me so I can cut this shit. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. We don't need to cut it. No, don't cut, cut it. it. I, I meant like just halt oh. everything. Oh, oh. Um, we need to address yeah. Mark's birthday. Yeah, no, it's good. Did you I, do anything uh, today to to celebrate? No, fucking the busiest day ever. My wife oh, was okay. at work all day. No, zero. I will say I always feel super young, and being thirty five now and realizing that I'm five years away from being forty is like the first time where I'm like, fuck, am I old? Like, <laughs> yeah, so it's, you are. We are. It feels weird. What's what's what got me more. I turned 35 in October. Um, not that I'm five years away from 40, but that I, I, we're only 15 years away from being 50. 15 years feels like a lot to me still. Oh, it feels like nothing now. Really? Feels like we're, we're as close to 15 years, years ago. We were, were at 20. 20. That was a long ass time ago. I've That's been a lot of shit well, since 20. No, I don't There's know, man. 20 feels like, 20 feels like it, it was three weeks ago for me. Really? Wow. <sighs> You can do a lot of dumb shit in 15 years, Mike. I ha- and I believe me, I have. 
Uh, all right. All right. Uh, let's finish up these Game fight on. announcements real quick. Um, so we've got Bruno Silva versus Jordan Wright. It's a fantastic fight. Uh, I think Bruno Silva just fought like a week or so ago, right? A couple of weeks, yeah. A few weeks. Uh, Jordan Wright is fantastic. Uh, he's a, 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 I want to say he's a Taekwondo fighter or a karate fighter. I can't remember specifically what style, um, but he favors his legs a lot. Has great dexterity in his legs. Um, very interested to see how that fight goes. That's going down UFC 269 December 11th, so fairly quickly. Uh, we have another fight for uh, Michael Pereira. Uh, he's going to be fighting Muslim Sil- Slikov. Salikov. Uh, what is it? Salikov. Salikov. Uh, and that's going down UFC Good fight fight. night January 15th. That's a welterweight fight. That really? should be interesting to see how, how that turns out. Uh, Shamil Abdurahimov is fighting... The up and comer Tom Aspinall. Oh, baby. Hey, dude, I saw that booking. I don't really like it. Really? Like, so here's why. To me, Chris Dawkins and Tom Aspinall have had like the same exact rise and accomplishments. So I see Chris Dawkins get Derek Lewis, and I'm like, sick, who's Tom Aspinall gonna get? And he gets Shamil Derek Hemo. Like, I thought we were past that already. Well, like, remember I- th- this the th- Tom talked about how he's not trying to rush anything. He's not, he doesn't want Derek Lewis. I don't think he wants. Yes, man. I he guess. wants to work his way up. He wants to get that experience. He wants the names on the resume. Honestly, man, as long as he doesn't fall down the ladder, take I the guess. route that you want, you know? I guess, I guess. Uh, well, that fight is happening. UFC fight night, March 19th, obviously heavyweight fight. And then uh, it looks like, so we talked, I think, recently about Macy Barber having uh, dropped out of the fight. Miranda Maverick is actually taking that spot against Aaron Blanchfield. Uh, So that'll be going down December 11th, 269. That are your fight announcements. Thank you for joining the sphere. (laughs) Thank you, sir. All right, guys. So let us now turn towards this coming weekend, UFC fight night, Holloway versus Rodriguez. That is Max Bless Holloway versus Yair Rodriguez. Woo-hoo-hoo. What a fight. What a fight. Uh, Mark, let me start with you. What is your take on this uh, upcoming amazing bout between Holloway and Rodriguez? So it's an awesome fight simply because Max is never in a bad fight. He's the man. And Yair is obviously crazy entertaining and can do crazy shit. At the same time, I feel like it's kind of just like a bump in the road on the way to Max Volk three. I really can't see any way. Yeah. Year wins this fight. Really? Um, wow. Yeah. Year's a great fighter and he can finish fight. Like I said, in so many ways, he's slick, he's dynamic. I, there's just no chance that I am picking the Max Holloway that just destroyed Calvin Cater hmm. to lose to any 145 pound man on this earth right now. I'm not hmm. doing it. I will. I will not. Um, as I said, yeah, is good. Let, but let's not forget he was getting manhandled by, I mean, not manhandled, but he was getting kind of whipped by the Korean zombie prior to KOing him at the very conclusion of, of that fight. I just don't think he's on Max's level. I, I don't think any featherweight is on Max's level other than Alexander Volkanovsky. Um, as I've said before, when they fight again, despite it being 2-0 Volk, I will be picking Max. And Volk is impressing me more and more every day. I just think Max is that damn good. He's so good everywhere. He takes damage better than Yair. He game plans better. He causes more damage than he, than Yair. Maybe not off one strike, but certainly overall uh, in a fight. Could he get caught? Yeah, it's MMA. And Yair has super funky, unique striking. It's possible, but it's a low probability to me. And I think Max takes this very convincingly. Mm. I don't know if I want to say he finishes him. I'm torn on that because Yair's tough. I could see it going to a decision where he's just kind of hanging in. I could also see it being like an accumulated beating where he almost, not like that he can't get off the stool, but that it just kind of like ends. I don't know what I want to say. I will say that Max stops him fourth round. Oh, Omar. Wow. That's not what I was expecting. That is quite the, uh, you know, authoritative take. Omar, what's your take? Uh, this great matchup uh, in the top 10 at featherweight. Yeah, this is pure ninja shit. Excuse me, top five, I should say. Pure ninja shit in this fight. Um, it's it's very difficult to pick. I would have to agree with with Mark, though, that 
I, I can't. I I love Yair Rodriguez. I've loved the Yair for since tough. Like I I love Yair. Um, but I can't pick Holloway, or I can't pick against Holloway. Yeah, I just, yeah. I just can't. Yeah, I just can't. can't. He's too good. He's too can't. good to pick against. I'm not gonna be mad if Yair wins. Yeah, but it just. There's there's nothing to really tell me that Yair should win this fight, I guess. Because if Yair does beat Max Holloway, it's going to have to be in some kind of spectacular fashion. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's and he's definitely not to going to outbox side. him. He's he's not going to outbox him. He's not going to outstrike him. He's not. He's not a boxer. He's he's not going to he's not going to like dominate him for five rounds. That there that no, no way in hell. He's ha- either going to catch him or get dominated. Yes. Yeah. I mean, at, be, at best, he catches him early. Maybe Max has a hard time recovering, and perhaps there might be some domination as a result of that. But I, out of all the fights we've ever seen Max in, that's never really happened. So, okay. I was just going to say the Max that just beat Calvin Cater may have been the best fighter I've ever seen in a cage. Oh my God. That was crazy. So that's why I'm like so heavy on max right now i will say this you know what makes this fight interesting is that style that yair brings in that not many guys do i mean i i love in each division it seems like you know the entire ufc roster is sort of dotted with these guys who bring in this sort of unique you know yeah. unique in that it's 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 not that common the sort of like taekwondo or karate style you know the wonder boys that year rodriguez is you know because you know MMA is is populated primarily by guys who bring in either boxing or Muay Thai or some kind of combination of the two. There aren't that many guys that bring in karate or pure Taekwondo. And Rodriguez, that's what makes him so goddamn amazing to watch because at any moment in any fight, he can pull some, pull some amazing move off. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I thought no, you were going mean, to make a totally pick right. after that. I was oh, you're totally right. <laughs> no, I mean, and you're absolutely right. You, you're, there's no, there's just no way that I can pick against Max Holloway. So I'm going to go with Holloway by decision. Yeah, if you're somebody who likes Yair, so for, I was sorry, I was going to say before that the odds are, are super wide. Max is minus six hundred and Yair is plus four fifty. But if you're someone who likes Yair, I would look at what the odds are on a round one KO because if he's plus four fifty, those odds are going to be high. And if Yair is going to win, that's kind of, I think, how it would have to happen. Because I think once they settle in, Max will be much harder to catch. So if it's going to happen, I think it happens early. But I don't think it's going to happen. <laughs> Not to mention oh, Yair yeah. tends to be a lot crazier in the beginning of the fight when he has a lot of energy. There's a lot more yeah. spinning attacks and, and, and a variety of attacks. Once he starts getting into rounds three, four, five, it tends to be very like. Yeah, and I'm like sure he'll be taking like damage a normal as it goes on too. Yeah. Okay. So it looks get like me we're to all Max Holloway. Three. What's that? Get me to Volk Max three. <laughs> uh, any other fights you guys want to shout out or fighters you guys want to shout out on this fight night card? Yeah. So there's kind of a lot that I feel like are worth mentioning. Um, I don't know how you, how you want to do it, Omar. I don't know if you want to go back and forth or you yeah, go first it- one. I'll follow up on what you don't touch. Yeah, I guess just grab a guy and I'll grab the next one. All right. Um, so the one that I probably like the most is Song Yudong versus Julio Arce. Um, these are two guys who are like right on the edge of the bantamweight rankings. Uh, Yudong has a win over Marlon Vera, who we were just talking about. Content, contentious, close win, but has it. Uh, super powerful. I want to say he's six and one. Let's verify that before I speak incorrectly. Yeah, 6-1-1 one, one in the UFC so far. The guy's been a beast. And then Julio Arce on the other side is a guy who beat Dan Ige at featherweight, who's a top 10 featherweight. Um, and now, obviously, he's fighting at bantamweight. The, the, the dude has skills. The, both of these guys are the real deal. Either, either of them could jump up in the rankings at any moment, and, and this is a big fight, whoever comes out of this one. Yeah, um, I would say uh, one of the ones to definitely watch out for is actually in the prelims for me, uh, Miguel Baeza. Miguel Baeza is a fantastic up-and-comer. Um, I love his technique. I love the way that he fights. Um, very, very strong striker. 
Um, and he's fighting Chaos Williams, who, if you've ever seen Chaos Williams fight, is literally the namesake that, that he carries around with him. The man is a walking, Nightmare. walking time bomb in both of his hands. Um, I think it'll be a fantastic fight. I think there's a lot of violence to be had in that fight. Um, but personally, I think Baeza is going to really be able to shine and, and, and really show what he's about. Yeah, he hung with Ponzinibbio for that whole fight. Mm-hmm. Last fight. He's, is good. Good, man. Very good. <clears throat> um, next one I'll touch on is Tiago Moises, who's coming off that loss to Islam, but he had been moving up the ranks himself. He's fighting a guy who is ranked significantly lower than him, but it's Joel Alvarez. Or Ed, it might even be pronounced Joel Alvarez. Uh, apologies if I'm getting that wrong. But um, he's 3-1 and one in the UFC so far. His best win is probably Joe Duffy, so he doesn't have that signature win. Um, but his only loss is to Demir Esmagulov, who's very good. And Alvarez is going to have a huge size advantage on uh, Moises. I actually forget what it was. I looked at it earlier. I want to say it was like five, six inches. Like, it, it was a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's well-rounded, so it's, it's going to be an in- interesting fight. Um, we might see a guy jump hugely in, in the rankings if Alvarez can, pu- can pull that one off. Nice. Anybody else, boys? I want to say that's pretty much it, really, for me. Mark, you got um, one more? Well, we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, I actually have a couple, if that's, if that's all right. Um, I like the Cynthia Calvillo versus Andrea Lee booking. Um, they are, they have styles that I, I think could make for a lot of like really closely contested uh, spots in that fight. But Calvillo, if she's going to be a title challenger, which she obviously was hoping she was coming into her last fight where Andrade took her out really is going to need to turn back Andrea Lee because Lee is only ranked like 15th. So that's going to kind of be a, a shot to Calvillo if she loses, but I think that's like a coin flip fight. I, I could absolutely see it. Uh, they match up interestingly. And then um, Omar, unless you had another UFC one you wanted to touch on, I actually want to just mention what's going on in Bellator as well. Oh, right. Yeah, no, let's go to Bellator. <clears throat> So Bellator, you got a couple fights of note. Oh, um, main oh, event, yes. obviously Chris Cyborg, mm-hmm. still the second best women's featherweight on the planet. Um, defending against Sinead Cavanaugh, which kind of sucks. Sinead Cavanaugh, super random. I don't know why it's her that's getting this title shot. She's four and four in Bellator. She doesn't even have a name on her resume. It's really random. I'm I'm confused about it. I thought this was going to be Kat Singano. For some reason, it's not. Um, so it's really just cyborg eating her next meal she's minus 2000 last i looked um but if you want to see cyborg dominate someone that's going to be happening um co-main is tyrell fortune against linton vassell at heavyweight fortune is a guy who has wins over matt mitch rion and saeed salma who just beat minikov by, by that injury um his only losses to tim johnson in his whole career so far so he's potentially got to watch linton vassell who was obviously a quality light heavyweight for a while is two and one since moving up to heavyweight and he beat Sergey Karatanov. So that's, that's kind of an interesting fight right there. The, the winner of that one is, is so, someone to pay attention to. And then lastly, Aaron Pico's goes on this card, who is oh, the yep. prospect of Bellator, who's obviously taking his losses, but he's hot again right now. I think he's won four in a row, I believe. Um, and he's fighting another big prospect who uh, is 12 and 0 uh, himself in Justin Gonzalez. Pico is the favorite pretty significantly, but uh, it'll, it'll be good if he can, if he can turn back a, a fellow prospect here. Yeah. Nice. Aaron Pico is definitely one to watch that boy. Win or lose has never been in a decision. Like he's, yeah, I love he's, his Pico. fights are bangers. All of them. Oh, yeah. uh, we have a Valerie Lareda sighting, uh, arguably the thirstiest account on Instagram. So true. And she was so tight that she got put on the prelims. She was like, Bitch, that she should be must-see TV or whatever. Who's that? Valerie Loretta. Valerie Loretta? She kind of looks like J-Lo. Really? Except infinitely less attractive than J-Lo. Oh. <laughs> you don't know Valerie Loretta from Bellator? She chills with uh, Masvidal sometimes? Yeah, you'd recognize her. Masvidal's girlfriend? <laughs> Is it his girlfriend? No. I don't know if they're actually dating. Yeah, I don't think they're dating. Are they? By the way. He's he's been oh no she's making out with somebody else nope <laughs> yeah I didn't think so I think they're just friends he's dating she looks like she dates is she you know what never mind she might be dating a a a, a, a reggaeton singer rapper oh, good for her good performer for 
All right, I'm going to close out with one trivia question for you boys. I like how we end with trivia lately. I'm into it. (laughs) Here we go. Yes. Famous MMA manager, Ali Abdelaziz, whose name we invoked earlier in this episode. I scrolled down his Wikipedia page. Ali has himself a professional mixed martial arts record spanning from 2004 to 2007. He fought once in each of those years. So he has four professional fights. Guess his record. One in three. Mark? I mean, I've looked at his record before. Like, oh, I you know have? this. That he has- Oh, you I, both know this? I, I, I've, I've looked I, at it before. I don't know the answer. Like, I, But I've looked at his record before, and I know he had fights, and I, I just don't remember what his record was. I'll say... Oh, and four. <laughs> he was one and three. Uh, okay. Was that a guess, Omar? Was that an educated guess? It was an educated or guess because you know? I, re- I remember looking up his record and I just remember solidifying in my head, oh, he does suck. Like, I, I just, I remember <laughs> that. Me and you already said one and three. That's why I was like, I'll go with all four. Yeah, I just, I just remember that that be the case. Yeah. And also a little fun fact is that all four fights were ended by submission. <laughs> I know he's a big jujitsu guy. That was where he yeah. started his whole his whole thing was jujitsu. Interesting. Well, there you have it, boys. Uh, another one in the books uh, for our audience who are watching on YouTube. Please, once again, hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon so that you never miss an episode. Find us wherever you get your podcasts uh, if you want to do audio only, and of course, join the conversation one last time on social media at and new underscore MMA show in all the places. Gentlemen, any parting shots? I didn't fall asleep, but I am damn sure going to sleep now. (laughs) Omar? Uh, This weekend's fights are impaired with my five-year anniversary with my wife. Hey, Ah, we have all the events. Happy birthday one last time to Mark, and happy anniversary to Omar and Francesca. Yeah, we'll be partying it up this weekend. Probably not. We'll be indoors. (laughs) Okay. You yeah, know, it's, so it's cold, getting cold right? down yeah. there, man. It's getting cold <laughs> in, in Tampa. Uh, I got to walk out with full length pants on. I'm uh, not about this shit. All right, Thanks, audience. Guys, we will for see listening. You next week. We will Peace. see you next week. Peace. Peace. Adios.